Canada has been home to sex trafficking crimes for decades, but official efforts to combat the crime have been criticized for years. Now a new connection has emerged in the world of sex trafficking following a New York Times expose that found thousands of videos of sex trafficking victims on the international porn site Pornhub. Calls to regulate the porn industry have been echoing ever since, and currently there is a bill waiting to be passed in the Senate, which would be one of the first to put regulatory measures directly on the porn industry. But before we get into that particular bill, we want to discuss what exactly sex trafficking is. Joining us now is Ms. Katerina McLeod, founder of Rising Angels. Ms. McLeod is also a survivor of sex trafficking and advocate for other victims and survivors. Welcome to this Forum Daily special report, Ms. McLeod, and thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. Now, in addition to being a sex trafficking survivor yourself, ma'am, at Rising Angels, you work directly with survivors of this crime. So can you tell our viewers what exactly sex trafficking is and who the victims of this crime usually are? Okay, so, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that sex trafficking is just happening abroad, and it's happening here in our own backyard. So this is um, happening to these women who are getting lured in by what we call the finesse pimp who is portraying to, you know, love her. Um, he becomes, you know, her Romeo. He's going to save her. He's going to give her the life. And he manipulates her into this. And he ends up sex trafficking her and moving her, you know, all across Ontario from hotel to hotel, um, making herself herself for him. And uh, we did mention that you are a survivor of this crime yourself, ma'am. Uh, would you be able to share your story with us and tell us how you were taken into the world of sex trafficking? I was in a very um, bad situation with an abusive man, and I started going to a support group for women who were being abused as well. And in that group, you know, you kind of share your story with women and you make friends with them. And that's what I did. And there was one woman who really took a liking to me. She had big blonde hair. She dressed scandalous. And she was a pimp and she offered me a job. And at that point, I thought if I could save enough money, I could escape the abusive situation that I was into. Um, and she made it sound very easy. So that's how I ended up getting lured in. And then I spent the next 15 years, um, you know, working in strip joints out of my car, out of hotels and being pimped out by other pimps along the way. Wow, ma'am, I can't imagine being in a situation like that. And it's unique knowing that uh, this pimp was also a female uh, who recruited yes. you. Um, so how did you eventually escape your situation? It was actually a client um, who offered me an out and I took it and he supported me and my kids. I had four. I had four. He supported me and my children. And then three years after he left me. So I had become his private prostitute. He controlled all the money. But in my mind, it was better than servicing all different kinds of men. And it was actually my eldest daughter's um, youth group leaders who ended up coming alongside of me and helping me get on my feet financially, physically, emotionally. And they became my mentors. And that's how I ended up where I am today. So what, what more do you think is needed in Canada in terms of supports and resources in order to prevent more young people from becoming victims of this crime, ma'am? I think education is key. We need to be getting into, you know, middle schools and educating those kids because they're vulnerable. I mean, the average age of somebody watching pornography is nine years old. So these kids are being exposed to this and desensitized from sex um, because everything is about sexuality out there right now. So, you know, for me, education is key. We need more places to be able to house these women who are coming out. We do see some second stage housing, but there's nothing at the first stage. And that's really what's needed um, for these women women so that you can pull them out and they actually have a place to go and start the recovery and healing. We need to have um, strong, stronger criminal, um, you know, what these guys are getting when they're being caught is, is nothing. It's a slap on the wrist. It's six months. It's time served. It's this. And I think we need to change the narrative, right? Like the police cannot do anything unless a victim is willing to come forward. And that's really hard to ask somebody to do um, when they've gone through this kind of trauma and then to re-traumatize them in court. And then the conviction is not even worth it to these women. So there has to be another way that these officers can go after these pimps and traffickers without needing a victim. And uh, we know that sex trafficking survivors could be as young as 12, 13 years old. Uh, how can parents or supervisors identify if their child is being targeted by a sex trafficker, ma'am? About 30 seconds left. I think it's just, you know, being aware of who your kids are talking to online, having their passwords. There's a lot of, you know, 
different things that are happening online where parents aren't being aware of who their kids are talking to, who their friend um, list is, and knowing that and watching the signs. If you start seeing your child who is being really secretive, meeting somebody and not telling you who it is, um, they're picking them up down the street, you see their demeanor changing, they're coming home with money or gifts that they couldn't even afford. I mean, those are some red flags to watch out for. All right, we'll be right back with Ms. McLeod with more. Stay with us, everyone. Welcome back to this Forum Daily special report. Before the break, we spoke with Ms. Katerina McLeod about her experience being a sex trafficking survivor and what is needed in Canada in terms of supports and resources for victims. We also, we also mentioned Ms. McLeod's organization, Rising Angels. So ma'am, can you share with us the work you do at Rising Angels to help rehabilitate and provide support for survivors? Absolutely. So we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring for these women and that's very important for these girls um, and women to be able to have somebody who's gone through this walk alongside of them. So we are like the 24 hour of the day, you know, my, our phone's available. So if these girls are having breakdowns or they're struggling, they can call it two, three, four, five in the morning. We too have trauma informed counseling and we help these girls financially get on their feet. So, you know, you know, if they need their groceries bought or, you know, help paying their bills, rent, whatever it is, these are the services that we offer them. And, and now we have evidence of sex trafficking victims being further exploited online. Uh, have you worked with any survivors who have been exploited online through these pornography websites before? I have. I have. I have a few girls whose um, pimps had videotaped them um, when they were having sex and, you know, not only used it as blackmail, but ended up uploading it onto pornographic websites. And the girls weren't even aware of this um, until a friend would come to them and say, oh, my gosh, this I seen you on this pornographic website and it's really hard when that happens because this is out there and you've got millions of people viewing this and just the thought of somebody seeing you be so vulnerable um, being forced to do something you don't want to do it sticks with these girls for a long time. Now to add to that in a previous conversation you mentioned that you had friends who were directly trafficked into the porn industry uh, would you be able to share some of these stories with us? Absolutely. So I have a few um, women that I had worked with when I was in the game and they haven't gotten out, unfortunately. And along the way, they were being trafficked, held against their will, forced to, you know, have sex with clients and give the money to the pimp. But then the pimp um, started putting them into pornography, making them go and get, you know, have sex with different men, videotaping it, because there's a lot of money to be made from that, especially when people are clicking on and you have to pay for these sites. So if you're watching that video, you know, you're getting royalties from this video. So I know a lot of women personally who were trafficked into pornography and the violence that they suffered, the things they were made to do, um, the degrading acts and I hear their stories all the time. I hear my girlfriends talking to me and saying, like, I was forced to do this. It was rape. Um, you know, my video's out there for everybody to see. I really didn't consent to this. I was being forced to this, forced to do this. So this is the kinds of things that is happening um, in this world of pornography, unfortunately. So what do you think needs to be done to address pornography and its connection with sex trafficking, ma'am? You know, I really firmly believe that somebody who... Um, consciously makes a decision to be in pornography, I believe there's unresolved trauma that leaves you vulnerable to even think this is a viable job or a viable decision. So I think, you know, we need to have more resources available for women who have had traumatic experiences happen to them prior before ever making this choice. And I say that very loosely um, because I don't believe that this is something that somebody would really want to do. I mean, I've been on Pornhub scrolling it, seeing, looking at what's going on to, you know, keep myself up to date on, you know, the variants of the pornography that's happening. And it's violent. It's degrading. Um, women are being, you know, spit on their hair pulled. They're being raped. They're being forced to do things they don't want to do. And it seems that, you know, we need to change the mindset of the men who are watching this. It, it starts with them, right? This is, a, it, this is a supply and demand industry. And it seems that the men want to see women um, being hurt and raped and forced to do things and, you know, discriminated and all of those things. So I think, you know, we really need to do something with the people who are viewing this and educate them on what is really happening behind the scenes. This isn't something that these girls are enjoying. Um, they're being hurt. 
Now, uh, as we mentioned, uh, sex trafficking can take multiple forms. Uh, we just connected the porn industry as being used as a tool in the sex trafficking industry. Uh, what other ways has this crime evolved to be hidden under plain sight, ma'am? About 45 seconds left. Well, we know we see guys now going into Airbnbs and renting Airbnbs in, you know, um, higher end areas. So nobody was suspect, suspected, right? It's just like a big party is happening, but actually girls are being held in these Airbnbs and being forced to service men. Um, it's not so much hidden as it used to be. It almost seems like this is acceptable in society, you know, like everybody says, well, prostitution has been around for a very long time. The girls are choosing to do this. The girls are choosing to be there. They're not understanding all of the elements that have happened to these women to fall into this and that they are being held against their will. So it's happening everywhere. It's not just happening, you know, um, in seedy motels. It's happening in higher end motels. Like I said, in the Airbnbs, we see it happening in the schools now. Um, we see friends pimping pimping out friends. We see families pimping out their daughters. So people really need to understand that this is happening right here in our own backyards. Ms. McLeod, thank you again for giving us your time on Forum Daily Special Report and sharing this important message. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back, everyone. Earlier in this report, we mentioned a bill that is on standby in the Senate, which is looking to add some regulation in the porn industry. Bill S-203 was introduced by independent Senator Julie Miville de Chêne even before the New York Times expose was released. And it looks to make it a criminal offense to not verify the age of users before they enter an adult site. If passed, this would be a step towards imposing stricter regulations on the porn industry. Well, to talk more on Bill S-203, we are joined by independent Senator Julie Miville de Chêne. Senator, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you for inviting me. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about Bill S-203 and what is missing in terms of safety and regulation in the porn industry? So a lot is missing, but obviously porn, as you know, has become more and more hardcore, violent and degrading for women. So that's the, the base. But also uh, porn sites do not verify at all the age of visitors. They don't because Canadian law doesn't require them to. So children, an average age of 11 years old, are first exposed to porn. Uh, so it's very young and very worrisome. And also arms can be done. Uh, the way children and youth will look at women the, as objects, also uh, the problem with the twisted vision of sexuality, more aggressive behavior, arms can be done by this exposure to porn. So um, as you know, when you're offline, all porn is regulated. You can't buy a Playboy if you don't show your card. You can't go to a porn film without showing an identity card. It's not the case on the web. So that's why I'm saying it should be the same, same rules because we have a consensus in our society that porn is an industry for adults. And so my bill really wants to protect children and teenager from exposure to porn, to porn. And to do that, as you just said, we are making it a criminal offense to to distribute uh, sexually, uh, sexually explicit material to children. So that would become a criminal offense if it's done for com commercial purposes. And that's exactly what porn sites are doing. And second, uh, the minister will have um, a pretty uh, extensive power and they will be able, if companies uh, do not obey, to basically blocking access to porn sites in Canada. So it's an important law. It has teeth and I really hope it's going to be adopted. Now, I really want to go back to the start, to the creation of this bill. Uh, we mentioned that you've been advocating even before the NYT expose. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more on how this all started? So um, almost a year ago, I was demonstrating in front of um, MindGeek, which is the, the, the owners of Pornhub, right here in Montreal. This is not far from where I live. So I started researching and I was absolutely appalled by what I found, which is um, sexual exploitation on the site and also the fact that the uh, business model of Pornhub was to upload videos without checking on the consent 
or on the age of participant to this porn. So for me, this was uh, not right, especially at a time of Me Too, where consent should be um, really um, um, at the middle of everything. And my background too uh, was important. I've been uh, the president of the Quebec Council on the Status of Women. So I have a feminist um, look at this uh, situation, a point of view, a feminist point of view. I've been studying prostitution, violence against women, uh, and pornography. All those uh, questions are linked. And for me, this bill too will have a feminist impact because those children should have um, um, uh, should have a look at sexuality, which is not unequal for women, which shows that women are equal because it, this is not a bill to defend pornography. Porn is a legal industry. As a mother, as a feminist, obviously I have concern about what I see. I can't tell you I don't have concern, but this is not my aim. My aim at this point is to protect children and teens from this exposure to material that's pretty offensive sometimes. All right, ma'am, we've got to wrap up the segment, but we've got 30 seconds left. How has this bill uh, fared in the Senate? Do you have any opposition from MPs? Well, I have to say I have a pretty large consensus in the Senate among all the groups that this is needed. So that's really a good point. Some questions uh, about how do you do this age verification without compromising uh, the privacy of personal data? That's a fair question. And we have answers for that because it's a third party that should do the verification. Also, some people are a little afraid of the freedom of expression and also of the fact that science is not absolutely certain on, on all the arms of porn. But I'm saying let's take the principle of precaution here for our kids. All right, we'll take a quick break, but we'll be right back with the senator. Stay tuned. And we're back with our Forum Daily special report with Senator Miviel Duchesne. Uh, now, before the break, we were discussing Bill S-203 and the fact that there is no opposition to the bill in the Senate, but its passing has been stalled. So, uh, Senator, what needs to happen for Bill S-203 to pass and how can Canadians help? So, unfortunately, as you said, it's been slow because of the pandemic. We've been sitting fewer times and when we're sitting the government bills have the priority and not the private bills like mine so we are in second reading speeches have been done but there's a long way to go because after being adopted by the senate which it's not it has to go to the house of commons and go through the whole process because it's a reverse process so how can you help first you know obviously i need support and i have support in the civil society i've been I, having a lot of support, I have to say, parents groups, experts, uh, feminist group, a whole lot of groups have been very active on social media to push a bill S203. A petition has been circulating. You can talk about it in the social media, obviously, and you can also write opinion pieces on that. It's a real worry of parents out there. And um, I think uh, the political uh, parliament has been slow to pick up on this worry. You know, yes, freedom of expression ex is extraordinary, but now the cost of this freedom of expression on porn site is incredibly worrisome because we are destroying the life of girls and women. Now, I really want to touch on uh, current laws and regulations around the porn industry. Uh, so does Canada have any regulation or laws around the development and production of pornographic content in Canada? Yes, we do. We have, in fact, uh, pretty, uh, pretty strong laws. The problem is not uh, or is not uh, only our laws, but it's generally the fact that uh, after the laws is written, it has to be uh, put in practice. And our laws, for example, what they do, they prevent, um, uh, it's illegal to produce and distribute certain type of pornographic material. Uh, it prohibits material, child pornography is, is, uh, is prohibited, non-consensual distribution of intimate image is, uh, is not permitted, and voyeurism. So you see, we have the tools 
but the problem is lack of enforcement of the law. And this is pretty worrisome because this has been going on for years and group are saying, what's happening? How come there's no uh, lawsuit against big porn uh, on those issue? Well, yes, uh, it's true that it is difficult because um, there's a question of territory. Uh, porn sites are not all based in Canada. A Pornhub is but not all of them. So that's complicated. The question too of uh, who, uh, you know, you need a, um, a, a complaint to act. So that's obviously also a problem. However, I have to say, I think we have to review our regulations because we heard the other day that Pornhub has never told the RCMP of a possible case of child pornography. This doesn't make sense. So it's like it's impossible because cases have been public. So there are problems in our regulation. And because of that, there's an immunity uh, for porn sites that I don't think uh, should exist. Now, uh, touching on these regulations, we know that um, Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbo, he's set to launch an online regulator and mandatory 24-hour takedown notice for illegal videos. So how would this impact uh, the production of sex trafficking-related pornographic uh, videos being posted online? Uh, again, uh, Senator, we've got a minute and 20 seconds left. So briefly, um, it's an, amb an ambitious law and it's welcome because at least there will be a 24 hour uh, delay to put down the material. We know that for some young women, it has been months of delay. So it's much better. It also ambitious because it's not only for porn sites, it's for all uh, the social platforms. So it could be Facebook, it could be other platforms where, yes, there is sexual exploitation. We'll have to see. But at this point, I'm very relieved that the government is trying to do something that he's aiming at porn and other arms uh, like hate speech. And, and, you know, there are many arms out there, but we'll see how uh, the porn industry industry will react to that. All right, ma'am, about 30 seconds left. But what other steps do you think need to be taken uh, to stop porn being used as a tool to exploit sex trafficking victims? I will come back to consent. For me, whatever is the business model of those porn sites, they have to make sure that consent of every and each person participating in those pornographic video that the consent is written and verified. We are at an age where we can't post uh, stuff that where you're not sure there's consent. And porn is not any industry. By definition, it's dangerous. It's intimate. There can be some, some exploitation. So I really believe, and it's not my problem that it doesn't go with their business model. They have to have a business model that take into account the importance of consent of everybody on porn video. And that's why, that's what I want personally. All right, Senator, thank you again for your time on Forum Daily Special Report. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me again. We'll be right back. The lawsuits continue to pile up against international porn site Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, as another allegation against the company's ethical practices emerges. This time, it's coming from a U.S. federal court in Alabama, where two young women claim that the website is facilitating child sex trafficking, adding that what parent company MindGeek said to Canadian legislators earlier in February is not enough. Montreal-based MindGeek's executives told a Canadian parliamentary committee that the system was being completely overhauled on February 5th. This follows a New York Times investigation in December, which found the site hosted videos of children, teens, unconscious people, and sexual assault, including videos of people who did not want to have their videos made public. This is the third lawsuit that has come to light against the porn giant in the last three months and comes after similar allegations from a legal action by 40 California women and another suit by an Ontario resident in Quebec. Well, joining us now to talk about the most recent lawsuit in Alabama is Mr. Gregory Zarzar, trial attorney at the Zarzar Law Firm in Alabama and lawyer representing this case. Sir, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Um, now, and thank you. Now, we know we can't get into uh, too much detail in regards to the two survivors in the suit, sir, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about this legal action and why it all started? 
Yes, uh, but again, let me say thank you to you and to the News Forum for its coverage. Thank you, sir. Of the litigation, of the litigation here in the United States. Uh, the case I am involved in was filed in federal court in Alabama. I have the honor of representing two survivors who have filed a lawsuit seeking remedies against MindGeek and certain affiliated companies for the harm uh, the survivors claim MindGeek caused them. In our lawsuit, we claim each of them were under the age of 18 when explicit videos of them were filmed and MindGeek then possessed, widely disseminated and financially benefited from. We contend uh, that this is in violation of US federal law, including the US law that defines sex trafficking. Now, the young survivors in the suit claim that MindGeek facilitates child sex trafficking. So for our viewers, can you define facilitate and how the porn industry is connected to the world of sex trafficking in terms of facilitating it? Well, while I can't talk much about the specifics of any pending litigation, uh, generally speaking, facilitate means to make the process easier, or in this case, the crime. Under the U.S. sex trafficking law, any commercial sex act that involves persons under the age of 18 is sex trafficking. Uh, for example, uh, some of your viewers may be familiar with a website that was shut down a few years ago called Backpage.com. Well, a subcommittee of the United States Senate conducted hearings about Backpage.com and ultimately released a report that concluded that Backpage.com knowingly facilitated sex trafficking in the way that it operated its website, despite the fact that it was known that sex traffickers were using the website to place ads for sex with children or other sex trafficking victims. Now, uh, this suit was filed uh, following testimony from MindGeek executives regarding an overhaul of their system. Uh, what were your clients and your team's reactions uh, to this testimony overall, sir? Well, I, I think our reaction was likely similar to a lot of others. Uh, there are many questions that still need to be answered, uh, and we intend to seek answers to some of those in our lawsuit. However, you're correct. We did refer to some of the testimony in the lawsuit we filed, and we very much believe more must be done to prevent future harms to our clients and to other survivors. All right, Mr. Zarzer, we're going to take a quick break, but we're going to come back and continue to discuss this lawsuit. We'll hear some messages from our sponsors during the break, but stay tuned, everyone. We talk further about Mr. Gregory Zarzar's lawsuit and his experience working with victims of human trafficking and child sex abuse. That and more news coming up after the break, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Forum Daily Special Report. I'm here with Mr. Gregory Zarzar, trial attorney at the Zarzar Law Firm in Alabama, and the lawyer representing the most recent lawsuit that came to light against Pornhub. Now, before the break, we spoke about a recent testimony by MindGeek executives to a Canadian parliamentary committee. They said that the system is going to be completely overhauled. So, Mr. Zarzar, in terms of this overhaul, have you seen any changes in terms of how the company operates, and has this made any difference in preventing sex trafficking-related content from making its way onto the site? Well, I think one thing was very clear after the, the uh, New York Times investigation piece ran in December of last year, and that was MindGeek demonstrated it had the ability to very quickly and dramatically identify certain types of videos on its website and remove them. This is an initial step. Uh, but in our law lawsuit, we are also seeking preventative measures to be put in place that would prevent any survivor from seeing their child sex trafficking videos on MindGeek's websites ever again. And uh, last week, we spoke with lawyer Ed Chapin, on, uh, who represents 40 California women in a similar lawsuit against MindGeek uh, in California. And he told us that there was no communication from MindGeek when victims reached out to uh, have their videos removed from their website. So have you had any communication with MindGeek executives regarding your suit? Well, let me uh, answer that this way. Under the U.S. court system, any defendant is 
and rightfully so, afforded an opportunity to formally respond to allegations in a complaint. At this time, we are in the process of completing the formal process that would trigger MindGeek's formal response in court. And I believe the formal court papers in any lawsuit uh, would be the best place to learn about this case and MindGeek's position on it once it is time for that response. All right, sir, we really want to get into your experience. We know that you're an advocate against human trafficking and child sex abuse. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience working with such victims and how they are personally impacted even after being removed from their difficult situations? Well, uh, I consider it a great honor uh, to represent survivors. The strength and resolve of child sex abuse and child sex trafficking survivors is inspiring. Uh, their willingness uh, and their ability to stand up and seek out justice in the wake of just horrific treatment uh, that is traumatizing just to even hear about, much less experience, often prompts others who may be suffering in silence to seek help. I know personally I'm a better person for having witnessed firsthand this determination and hope. And sir, why do you think it's important to regulate the porn industry? And why should Canada in particular be a leader in this effort, sir? We've got about two minutes left. Well, I think it's important uh, for any society to protect children and the dignity of all persons. Um, in my experience, leaders display character that inspires confidence. And I think all citizens should be able to look to their government leaders and see work that inspires confidence. I think it's also important to note that any industry that could or would exploit children should be stopped. There must be safeguards in place to protect against the monetization and marketplace of child pornography. While our laws here in the United States use that term, child pornography, I think such horrific images are better described as child sexual abuse material. Each of these images or videos is a horrific crime scene. And then having them spread throughout the world online and for eternity is something everyone should be working to prevent. And I would encourage anyone with the power to help end it to work accordingly. All right, Mr. Gregory Zarzar, we really appreciate you coming on our show and sharing the story with us. Thank you. Thank you for covering now stay with us. After the break, we dissect current Canadian laws around sex trafficking and the porn industry and discuss what it takes to get a bill passed in Parliament. Up next, we'll speak with lawyer Christine Van Gein, the host of Canadian Justice, and MP Dean Allison, the host of The Hill Update, after these messages. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back. Following these interviews, it's clear that there is a disconnect between sex trafficking laws and regulations around the porn industry. Historically, the development of laws around human trafficking have always been on the slower side in terms of being implemented. In 2007, British Columbia formed the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, becoming the first province to address human trafficking formally. It wasn't until June 6, 2012, that the Government of Canada established the National Action Plan to Combat Human Trafficking. June 2012 also saw the creation of the Human Trafficking Task Force to replace the Interdepartmental Working Group on Trafficking in Persons, which was created in 1999 to develop public policy on human trafficking in Canada, but was criticized for eight years by politicians and NGOs for failing to comply to a 2004 mandate to create a national plan. And now we have Bill S-203, still at second reading in the Senate, but faces no opposition from MPs, stuck in limbo waiting to be passed. And to talk more on the situation, joining us now is lawyer Christine Van, Gy Van Gyne, the host of Canadian Justice, and MP Dean Allison, the host of The Hill Update. Christine, Dean, welcome for, to the Forum Daily. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Now, Christine, uh, let's start with you. Um, what are the current regulations around this issue? Are there any legal implications for filming videos related to sex trafficking in Canada and posting them online? Yeah, so obviously it's a criminal offense to um, film it, it film child sexual abuse. So um, what we sometimes call child pornography, although we shouldn't refer to it as that, it's not pornography, it's images of abuse. 
So it's a criminal offense to record sexual images of a person under 18. It's a, a, a criminal offense to transmit or sell those images. Um, it's also a criminal offense to distribute images of a person, intimate images, if that person didn't give their consent um, to the distribution of those images. So that would include images of an adult person being sexually abused. And uh, there was also concern around uh, revenge porn, Christine, uh, being posted online following the NYT expose. Uh, what are the legal repercussions of posting revenge porn in Canada? Yeah, I'm actually going to be filming an episode of Canadian Justice about this issue. Um, the issue of revenge porn is, is a huge problem uh, in society. It's become a, a much more prevalent as, as we've become a more and more digital society. It is a criminal offense. Six, section 162.1 of the criminal code makes it an offense to publish sexual images of a person knowing that that person didn't give their consent. Um, so the the accused person would have to know that that person didn't give their consent or they would have to be reckless to that knowledge. Um, and the image would have had to have been given in the context of an expectation of privacy. So it doesn't matter if the victim in that case participated in the creation of the images, uh, sharing those images when there was a reasonable expectation of privacy is a criminal offense. And there are also civil penalties in several provinces. And what about uh, porn websites, Christine? Uh, can they be held accountable for publishing these videos under current laws? Yeah, so in Canada, users who upload uh, criminal content uh, are jointly liable with the companies that distribute it. So that's different from the United States where web flat platforms aren't responsible for user-generated uh, user generated material. And in December in Toronto, the first conviction uh, happened uh, under this law. Um, it was a, a Toronto-based platform called Yes Up Media, and they were the first company to be convicted of criminal charges that obligate uh, companies to report the online um, presence of sexual abuse imagery if they learn that their business is being used to access it. So in that case, the Toronto-based company had been warned hundreds of times that uh, one of their Vietnam-based clients was hosting massive amounts of, ch of child sexual abuse imagery. Um, but the law, that law is 10 years old, and it was just December that there was the first conviction and fine under, under that law. Now, uh, we've got about a minute left. I want to jump to Dean. Uh, looking back at Canada's track record in passing uh, human rights or human trafficking related legislation, uh, why is it taking so long to get such human rights bills passed? Well, you know, I think it's uh, it's more than just that. It just takes a long time to pass legislation, period. If you look at the, the record of governments, when we were in government, you know, because you talked about some of the things that were passed, we had a Bill C-36 that was passed by Peter McKay that dealt with some trafficking issues. And quite frankly, there's more, way more that needs to be done. During our time in government, we passed probably about 169 pieces of legislation in four years. The Trudeau government in four years passed about 100 in 11. So almost a third less, if you will, or 50% less. So obviously the amount of legislation you pass matters. Uh, we can talk about more about private members bills after the break, but I mean, just in, in terms of private members bills that were passed, 34 by the Harper government, 10 by the Trudeau government that actually made it from the time they were introduced until they were passed. And we can talk a bit more about the process when we come back. All right, we'll be right back everyone. Stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm here with lawyer Christine Van Gyne, the host of Canadian Justice, and MP Dean Allison, the host of The Hill Update. Now, before the break, we spoke on current laws around posting illegal pornographic content, and then we touched on the lengthy process of passing legislation around sex trafficking. So, Dean, uh, can you take us through the process of passing a bill in the Senate? What are the steps, and how long does it take on average? So if we go back to what I talked to you before the break about how many private members bills were passed uh, during the Trudeau government from 2015 to 2019, that was 10. That averages about two and a half a year. So if you think about private members legislation, if you're passing two to two and a half bills a year, that's taking you almost six months to a year on average to get things moving forward. And the challenge has been COVID has made it even worse. So typically everyone can introduce private members legislation. It's called first reading. We can all do that tomorrow. That happens, but then it's got to go to second reading and then have a vote. It's then got to go to committee 
It's then got to go to a uh, third vote. It's then got to be moved over to the House. The same process starts over again. So even if it's government legislation, it can take some time to pass. But if it doesn't have a priority attached to it, and I can assure you right now, so far, year to date, no, no private members' bills have been passed in the two years this government, or almost two years this government's been sitting. But remember, we've been sitting under COVID conditions, and it's been anything but normal. All right, Dean, so we have Bill S-203 having no opposition by MPs. Uh, what is it going to take to get this legislation to pass? So I, I think, uh, quite frankly, what, one of the things that would make it easier to do would be if the government would take it up as legislation. I introduced private members legislation on excise tax for the wine industry back in 2004. The finance minister, when we took government in 2005, made it his first part of his first budget. So really what needs to happen to get this done quickly is to have the government of the day include incorporated in government legislation. Government legislation takes precedent over private members legislation all day long. And because the Senate has not been sitting because of hybrid sessions, because of in-person sessions, translation, and the list goes on, the way that we could get this done quicker would be to have the government accept it as something they like, put it in one of the many bills that they have access to and talk about it that way. And Dina, is there anything that Canadians themselves can do in order to push this bill through the entire legislative process faster? Well, I think absolutely. That's a great question. One of the things that, uh, you know, people need to do, constituents need to do, is talk to the members of parliament, right? Regardless of the party, everyone supports this legislation. The challenge is always, there's so many things going on, so many moving parts. As I said, the Senate has not been sitting on regular sessions. I believe the Senate this year, and we're only into March, has only sat three or four times, maybe six times tops, and they have not been passing a whole lot. They've been looked at C7, the government legislation, right now on uh, the made legislation. So I think that what you need to do is you need to talk to your local member of parliament. You need to uh, l let them know, him or her know, how important it is to you. And then I would encourage uh, your members of parliament to talk to their government members to say, is there a way that we can actually make this part of government legislation? It has been done before, and I don't see why it couldn't be done as well if there was political will. All right, we've got about two minutes left, but Christine, uh, what would be your message as the host of Canadian Justice, a show that fights for the honesty in its title, in terms of the importance of passing a bill such as this? Yeah, bills like this that protect victims and, and will end the victimization, especially of, of children and vulnerable people are incredibly important. So um, we're gonna be following up on, on some of the issues that you've looked into in your report. I've, I've learned a lot preparing to talk about this with you today. And um, I think that the more Canadians get educated about the importance of this issue and the prevalence of human trafficking, um, the more likely we are to see this bill being successfully passed either as private members legislation or having the the majority the, the minority government take it up as a government bill. And Dean, uh, as an MP and the host of the Hill Update, uh, what can the passage of this bill lead to in terms of further efforts to regulate the porn industry? We've got about a minute left. <laughs> well, listen, I think there's a number of things you could do. If you look at red tape as an example, red tape, if you fix it once, is not fixed forever. It's something you need to be committed to forever. I would say absolutely, without a doubt, we need to do the same thing when it comes to trafficking, sex trafficking, and what's going on around the world. This is not a one and done scenario. As I mentioned, we passed Bill C-36, which was around prostitution, was also around sex trafficking. It, it went and took some measures. But as we learn more, and as criminals learn how to deal and work around it, there's always things that we could do a better job of. So I think what we need to do, there are task forces in place, but they need to make sure that they are on an ongoing basis looking for the loopholes and things that, you know, get these people trapped and figure out a way and be on this uh, all the time. All right, Dean and Christine, thank you so much for joining us. And that'll conclude our in-depth look at the connection between sex trafficking and the porn industry. I'm Nima Rajan, and we'll see you next time for another Forum Daily special report.